All right, guys, here we go. Okay, so we're gonna start instructor presentations. If you haven't been here before, um, we're gonna have all of the instructors that are teaching this weekend come on up and talk a little bit about their work. Um, it's gonna last about 10 minutes per presentation and it's really fun. And usually we tell jokes, but I don't have any jokes, but that's fine. Um, and our first instructor up is Kate Hawes, who's teaching in word working, woodworking, and to introduce her is Jamie Herman, who will bring the jokes. So I hope that he's ready for that. What did the shy pebble wish for? She wished she was a little bolder. <laughs> Take a picture. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jamie. I'm the artist fellow in the wood shop. Here to introduce Kate Oz. Um, <laughs> Kate has been working with wood for over 25 years. Their work ranges from custom furniture pieces to sculptural forms and carved utensils. They have taught uh, woodworking at Makeville Studio in Brooklyn, the Craft Students League, and the American Folk Museum. Please help me welcome Kate Oz. Okay, hello. Um, I feel pressure to tell jokes. I think that's the joke right there. It's <laughs> me eating a piece of wet birch. Um, so from that, which is somewhat... Oh, uh, there you go. There's the joke. I have good taste. Yeah, that's what we say about the wood people. Um, okay. So yeah, I've been a furniture maker since I was in my early 20s. This slide is sort of like how, you know, the first five to 10 years of my woodworking life, um, I worked for custom furniture makers, apprenticed with them in Brooklyn, New York. Um, they made like pretty fancy furniture that went into like Park Avenue apartments, you know, in New York, there's people who make every single thing, <laughs> you know, you forget that like, there are human beings like making every little thing in these like apartments and stores, everything. So there's a huge industry of craft happening in New York City. And it's pretty amazing, actually. Um, because there's a lot of money in New York City. So you get to make all sorts of fancy stuff. So I don't know, this is like a, some, a set of chairs that were a reproduction of some Art Deco chairs that the client had and they wanted more. So I copied them. This is like a, in the center is like a Kingwood veneer uh, side table. And then the other one is like something that I designed, which um, I was just sort of playing around with color and light. Um, but yeah, oh, this is a different, okay, that's okay, next slide, okay, that's that one, okay, this one, it looks a little different here, but that is okay, so this is, um, my sort of, my sculptural, you know, me being, like, you know, myself and saying, well, how do I make a box that doesn't look like a box, and so I made a round orb and then I put drawers in it because I wanted it to have some kind of function so some people are like oh they're, they're, there's you know they're like little places to stash things and that sort of thing um so that was uh the drawers kind of puncture the orb um and that's a just a piece that I did at a artist residency and uh Anderson Ranch um, in Colorado. And so I had really the opportunity to work big. So that was sort of me um, branching out to non furniture forms um, and working a little larger. Um, and that one is this is like a um, another sculptural piece. So you can see I kind of like these little flashes of color. It's made with a very thin plywood. Um, and then these, these are just like hand sculptures. So I, like one is the, the vertical one is like modeled after my forearm. So I was just interested. 
I think I'm a formalist. I'm really interested in form. <laughs> so I can get very entranced just in form. Um, that black one is like a like twisting sort of reclining type form. Um, yeah. And then form and function. So then, you know, stick another drawer in it. This is like a piece of oak that um, has a drawer that pushes and pulls through it. So I'm starting to like kind of get into like having a little fun with furniture, but not really furniture, maybe put it on the wall instead of on the floor. I don't know, this is just like my compulsive veneer, veneering very compulsively. Um, yeah, I mean, I think of this as like a cloud. So um, it comes out, it's like sticks out of the wall from the wall, like five inches. So it's kind of deep. Um, yeah, and then, I don't know, about five years ago, I started making like sculpture that was, uh, this is just made out of pine, which as a woodworker, we're sort of told is like inferior wood, um, but it, works just fine for a sculpture and does have some knots in it but it's it's sort of like a line playing around with form again um then I get into oh yeah that's just a detail to show off my joinery which is um you know woodworkers need to <laughs> woodworkers unlike I guess I don't know if potters show off their joinery but um woodworkers show off their joinery like how tight how strong like where, oh, how'd you make that go together? Yeah, so you can't see, but in there, connecting each piece is a tenon. So that's pretty fancy for, you know, so that I felt like that needed its own slide. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then I shift and I'm like kind of sick of like assembling things. So this is all my creative work. This is not my bread and butter work, which is buildings, people's cabinets and things. No. <laughs> um, but bowls got, I got really fascinated with carving. This is just sort of, instead of assembling things out of wood, many things, many parts fitting together with all my fancy joinery, I thought like, you know, I've never really tried just taking a big block of wood or some block of wood, whatever size it is, like that one I was biting into in the beginning and like, really just like diving into it and like seeing what you find, which is something many people do, but I had never done before as a trained furniture maker. So I got really, I've been very obsessed with carving lately and I'm teaching carving, which is really great. And I'm, I feel very honored to, you know, be able to share the process with people. And, um, you know, I, yeah, so I got into bowls. And so this is like, a pair that you know is from where I live up in the Catskills. Um, this one is a walnut um, with some nice stripes in it. Um, yeah, and I, you know, it's it's maybe it's not it. These are like functional objects. I want them to be functional. They're not like museum. They're not like go put it on a shelf. But they are labor intensive and they are quite refined. But I really enjoy making things that people can use. That said, this piece is not is not completely usable. I made this for actually a fundraising auction, and it's just a a bandsaw box, a, bo a small box that I carved. But um, so this is sort of goes back. I should have put this slide somewhere else because it's not a bowl. <laughs> because I was assembling pieces. This is a bowl, and this is carved. <laughs> it's all one piece of wood, and it's. You know, I really liked this bowl. It sold at the Peters Valley Gallery. And I miss it actually, because I really like that bowl. Um, but I should just make another one. This is an elm bowl that's um, very deep. And, uh, you know, I'm just, again, exploring form, like what's an interesting form. Um, and, Another walnut bowl, which vaguely looks like a bird, but I'm not sure really is a bird. Um, that's like a, a wall piece I did. Actually, I ended up painting it black, but it was a pine, 
like a doodle actually so yeah that's fun it's fun to take like a doodle like just some random shape and carve it um this is a, a an owl that i carved um yeah out of yeah a block of wood so more carving and then oh here we go we keep going i'm gonna keep moving here um <laughs> These are just shapes in my studio that I am playing with and I sort of rearrange and, you know, are, yeah, in process. Um, this is, so I put this in here because this is like something that I'm very excited about this like spoon carving moment that we're in, in the world. If, if not, if any, all of you have caught the spoon carving vibe, it's out there and people are really into spoon carving. And I, um, I'm really excited by Greenwood spoon carving because you can do it anywhere. You could do it on a park bench. You could, there's clubs and in, in that form where people like show up and carve together in circles. You can do it at a craft fair. You can do it, you know, in your apartment. It's great. So I've been very involved in that. And I, this is just like me, like out in the world teaching. You can be out in the world carving a spoon. Whereas the woodworking I was trained to do, you're like in the shop you know you had to be like in the shop so you're sort of like sequestered into your world but spoon carving is something you could take out and so like this bottom one I was actually in a museum spoon carving with like a public event at the uh, American Craft Museum or Folk Art Museum sorry in New York um, so it was like really great because like you can have like a public event and like you know people carve spoons so it's a, it's very fun and this is um, some of my spoons, just like whatever I have available. I'm really, you know, spoon people want spoons. They're very sellable. So the, again, this is not a three month project like what I was raised to do. This is like a, literally could take half a day or so. So it's very um, sellable. It's very accessible for people. Um, there's a sassafras bowl that I made. Um, my students are carving sassafras, so <laughs> there's a plug for sassafras, um, <laughs> the tree. Um, and then this is the last slide. So I will end with some coat hooks. So I am exploring like sculptural wall coat hooks that can be fun and, you know, creative um not a huge investment using small pieces of wood that I have laying around so um this is my talk and I am thank you for listening so thank you Kate that was awesome all right um I have a joke but it's not very good it's my dad told me this joke a lot when I was growing up what did one olive say to the other olive after it had fallen out of the tree? Olive. Olive. All right, I got laughs, so everything's fine. Um, next up is Zachary Lechtenberg in the Fine Metal Studio, and introducing him is our Fine Metals assistant, Megan Brooks. Okay, um, hi, Megan. I'm introducing Zachary Lechtenberg. Um, he is... Um, a metalsmith, he studied at Southern Illinois University for undergrad and received his MFA from East Carolina University. Um, he works part time as a studio artist and at the Quincy Art Center in Quincy, Illinois, where he is based. Um, and he makes work inspired by illustration. So, hello, everybody. Am I close enough? Can you hear me? Uh, let's. So this is me in my studio. I can see what's in front of me. So the studio I have, um, I, I set up after school with uh, pretty bare bones just for what I needed it to do. Um, so I went to school for enameling and continued to do saw and solder champlevé, which is what my workshop here is on. Uh, these are the accounts and skateboards and kind of some of the background into what uh, influences the work. Um, in graduate school, when I started, so 
I was starting out just drawing a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff that I continued to draw, but wanted the work to be packaged like uh, like the things that I collect. So thinking about the work in a way that I would uh, buy things from stores and see how how things are used and collected kind of shaped the way that I uh, chose to package the work and also depending on what kind of studio I was in at the time in graduate school it was uh, at the beginning I was just buying paper boxes and decorating those uh, later on during residencies people were using laser engravers so I was building boxes and packaging with that and then adorning that with imagery. Um, as far as well as like imagery and the the idea of the brooch or jewelry. Um, like like many other sculptural forms i'm trying to think about it and and the third dimension flipping it over and scratching into the back and drawing on whatever I can. Um, Let's see, this is kind of a bench thought of uh, playing around with imagery, either influenced by things or building with parts that I have sitting around in my studio. Um, okay, so this is this is one of my walls in my studio and kind of leads into, so the, the work that I create is more influenced by uh, me as a collector. Um, and so I collect like vinyl toys and figurines and records and things like that. So when talking to different uh, collectors in the art world, their idea of collecting was very much different from how I thought about it. So what I wanted to do with my work was change the way I package it to force collectors who collect my work to interact with it the same way that I collect work. And so what that does to a jeweler or to a jewelry collector, now that you have this packaged piece that's blister packed and sealed, they can no longer wear it. So their collector and no longer able to interact with it in the way that they want to, but are forced to interact in the way that I, I collect. And so all of these are uh, thermoformed packaging made on just like a, homemade vacuum forming box out of a block of wood and drilling some holes, box drilling some holes and shaping it around the brooches. Um, another thing that I've done to kind of include the language throughout the work is not only creating these boxes, all of, and of course I don't have an image where it's doing this, but all of the images would link up as like a set, um, creating this like collectible scene. Uh, as well as using decoders and things for people who follow my work um, may be able to read the things that I'm writing and kind of connect with it on different levels. Uh, outside of, so jewelry, jewelry gets expensive very quickly. So while I was doing a residency a couple of years ago, I started doing some slip casting and doing a like wax uh, engraving back into the surface and doing a uh, a a uh, underglaze inlay sort of process, as well as making stickers out of drawings and things that I design so that there are more affordable things outside of an expensive brooch that's packaged like a toy. Uh, this is my favorite slide now because of the last. The, the last presentation before me. So I'm taking all of these spoons that people could interact with. I'm carving them alone and scratching the plating off of them. So now they're no longer functional. And as somebody told me, I was so excited about all these drawings and illustrations on them. And a silversmith was like, you ruined them. Like why, like you're excited, but you just made art, who cares? So, and that kind of carries on to like, I've been buying like silver tumblers and everything else and carving on, carving and drawing on anything that I can in the studio. So it started out with enameling, which became like a, a step-by-step -step long process. So now it's just whatever I can 
pull into my studio and scratch into and change and manipulate. And uh, that's it. And I'll keep doing it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Zach. Next up is, oh, I'm going to tell a joke or something. We were having a heated debate during dinner. This isn't a joke. This is just something to think about. If there was an electric cord plugged into the wall that was 10 feet long, an electric cord plugged into the same outlet that was 100 feet long, would the one that was 100 feet long have less electrical output? Would the electricity dissipate? We don't know the answer. We were thinking about it. Food for thought. If you know, come up after, let us know. We'll be very interested to know. All right, next up is Tom and Mark Majorano. Is that right? Um, and our blacksmithing assistant, Sean Fitzsimmons, is gonna introduce them. How's it going, everybody? Uh, I got a separate introduction for each of them. The wonderful father and son team that are teaching the uh, five-day beginner class hang on this week. So starting with Tom, he started in a farrier school 50 years ago this year in Phoenix, New York. And he's Peters Valley uh, royalty, as far as I'm concerned. He started back here in 1972 with Jim Doubleday and then Glenn Gardner. He was renting space in the small shop that they had up by that little chimney over there with a leaky roof. And uh, the park made him, uh, made somebody demo from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., five days a week. So in exchange for renting space, he also demoed for any passersby and you know visitors to the park. He did that from 1972 to 1977. He started uh, some work, uh, a little bit of journeyman work in Orange, Massachusetts. And uh, then he started his at-home shop where uh, his son Mark learned to forge. And uh, he got into the blacksmithing uh, sales for farriers and blacksmithings at home. And uh, he, Peters Valley even had an account with this company. So very legitimate. Uh, please welcome Tom Majorana. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here after all these years too. Um, I guess I'd like to say that um, some of what Sean said was not exactly accurate, but uh, the first shop is indeed Remnants are, is right up above the, the dining hall. And uh, the shop that I spent time with, with Jim Doubleday is the old, what I just learned, uh, the old writing stable that is in really bad shape, I just learned tonight. And that's where uh, Peters Valley really got going with bringing in guest artists like Frank Turley and Bill Moran, the knife maker and all of that. So I got, for five years, I got to be part of the atmosphere here while I rented space. So I was a renter here twice. So, and I got to know, Sally Francisco, the original founder, very, very well. She was very kind to me, actually. So hit this one, huh? Yep. So in order, uh, in order to pay my rent, when I left in 1977, they needed a new sign. And uh, I offered two choices. Um, and this is the one they picked. And it was, well, wound up being a collaboration with uh, woodcarver Emil Milan who was kind of like, uh, talk about royalty. He was senior royalty here. This man was a, a, a renowned craftsman carver and he graciously um, agreed to, I designed it and he carved it. And um, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. I don't know what, what it was like for him, but it was great for me. So that's it up close. It sat up there for probably a good 20 years, I guess. And then, Things happen, and it was uh, for another 20 years, I think, maybe down in the scrap pile outside the blacksmith shop where all the other big things go. And it was uh, Dick Sargent, the last full-time resident here, I guess, who resurrected it and bought it, and now it's outside the store again with a different piece of wood, but it's it's still here. So it's, and um, I did manage to pay my rent by making the sign, so. The reason I left was I, wound up uh, becoming a partner with uh, a fellow who actually taught the first class here with Jim Doubleday. His name was Jim Fikes. They were the first instructors. Jimmy Fikes left, Jim Doubleday stayed. And as life will do it to you sometimes, when I was building the sign, Jimmy Fikes came through. He had a commission. This is basically his design. Uh, he allowed me though, as we got to build them, uh, to have some freedom to develop some of the elements and all of that, which I thought was great. So that, that's actually the reason when I left in 77, I went to Massachusetts, 
we made these two entranceway gates. And I have to apologize for the pictures and slides. They're all taken by me. No training in photography and no thought about making. I was just recording things, basically. So, so that was the pair of them. And they went to a client, private client in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts. So many years go by, we go into business. I worked for a nonprofit managing a farm. I got into the ferry supply business. And then finally we sold the business. And this was my first shop commission. A uh, local family ordered a, a, a small handrail. And I, um, cause I really got caught up when I went to horseman school, it was all handmade shoes. There wasn't any of the product that there is out today. And I got in, involved with the forgings and I like traditional forgings, historic techniques. So this is all done basically with um, traditional techniques. There's no welding, there's no modern welding or any of that. So another local commission after um, I was on, out, out of uh, the ferry supply business of a fire screen with doors. Um, quite the challenge for someone that wasn't very active for a long time, but um, I was kind of pleased when it got done. And the same, uh, same family, same woman actually, wanted a pair of andirons to go in that, and she also wanted to grill. So the design on that was a bit of a challenge for me, but we worked something out where she could grill in her own fireplace. This is basically a fireplace heater later grill. Actually, that's in my house. Um, I had a good friend of mine, a woodworker, make a bookcase and mantle, and um, he left the grill work up to me. So this is what I came up with. Uh, local again, I have a lot of friends that want iron, I guess I'm not sure, but uh, this is the little garden gate uh, that was done. Again, all traditional. And actually, Mark and I started this together. And lo and behold, he got a residency in Pendleton and he left before I got, got to the hard parts. So And this is also with Mark. This is a collaboration we did. He had a friend of his at Southern Illinois doing a master's. Let me know if I got this right. Doing a master's thesis. He had a, he had a, yeah, this was uh, Eric Cooper. He had, he had to do a, um, a presentation of, and he designed a working of collaborations basically. And Mark at this time was actually up at Haystack. So we did this, oops, sorry. We did this by a uh, fax machine. He'd write, do drawings and I do drawings and we send it back and forth. And I made, bunch of the parts, the metal parts, that's actually a ceramic handle on that poker. And um, not a great idea for a functional poker, but it looks really good. So, and then he came home and then we finished up all the parts and it came out really well, I thought, for, for not working together, for not being in the same shop together to make something was pretty. And Eric, by the way, got all the which is what he wanted. He got all the fact sheets from us. He got all the drawings. He got all the communications and put that in his presentation when he got the poker to present. And this is, I think, my last one. So this is something that I really find uh, dear to me. I got involved with total transformation of iron forging iron. So that flower and the leaf stem all came out of one piece of five eighths round stock that you see in the picture. That's all one piece. And it was all done with traditional techniques. And um, it was a bit of a challenge and I've made a few others like it, but that was by far is my favorite. So I thought I'd include that tonight. So, and that I think is it for me. Thank you. Coming back in for intro number two, uh, Mark Majorana. The son, he started blacksmithing with his father in the home shop at age 15. Uh, pestered him enough to get the blacksmith stuff out of storage and get it hooked back up to start out. He uh, went to the School of Ceramics at Alfred and then transferred to uh, the University of Carbondale for his BFA in metalsmithing. In 2002, he got a three-year Penland residency. And uh, during that time, he did a lot of independent work and started his own uh, studio, Mark Meyer on a studio in 2002, which is now 20 years old. So not quite 50 years of work, but a good round even number for you there. He's been teaching throughout uh, the, the craft schools on the East Coast, Haystack, Penland, Peters Valley. 
And uh, he has work right now in the Metals Museum and the Smithsonian, as well as Renwick. And he's been featured in the New York Times and Washington Post. And uh, I'm excited to see his work too. So let's uh, give it up for Mark Renner. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight and thank you Peters Valley for letting us do this uh, collaborative team teaching effort. It's long overdue. I don't know why it's taken us this long to teach together, but I'm, I'm really glad it's finally happened. And uh, we had a wonderful first day, stellar class, everyone put in a long, hard day and we've had good results. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I figure this would be appropriate. I don't get to show this often, but this is me demonstrating at the Sussex County Fair at 17. Uh, no, you're not even 17, because you weren't driving. Oh, really? Oh. Well, then they got it wrong. Dad had a booth at the Sussex County Fair, and we demonstrated, and we made snakes out of old farrier rasps and nails and just gave stuff away, and everybody loved it. But um, this was my intro into, into blacksmithing. Uh, like Dad, I was trained traditionally. He was trained traditionally, and thus I was trained traditionally. So starting off my ironwork career, it was certainly founded in ornamental ironwork as this uh, small flower piece uh, exhibits. He always says I give him too much credit, but you gotta understand the, the home forge was a forge and anvil stock and a hammer. So your, uh, the results that came from, from that process were really limited based on your imagination and what the material could do. And I think having that confined and basic home studio setup really made me learn the material, learn it well, and then really sparked my imagination for creating things. I was at the school of ceramics at Alfred, and then I transferred to Carbondale. And then by the time I got the Penland residency, I was shedding some of those traditional techniques that I learned from dad from, and from attending university and developing my own aesthetic was which was taking on a little bit more of a contemporary approach. And this spatula, which is in the collection at the Metals Museum, is a great example of these combined worlds. There's a very difficult forge weld in the middle of that thing. The handle is also kind of um, traditionally based, but still the end product is a little bit more that falls under a little bit more of a modern sensibility. And with this spatula, I was able to kind of launch a functional line of work based and built traditionally, but aesthetically took on a little bit more of a contemporary aesthetic. While I was at Penland, they were undergoing a capital campaign and they redid a major part of their campus. And that included um, in, in, uh, incorporating new hand railings. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I don't think I meant to do architectural work in, in that moment, but what it did is it allowed me to take risks. And I realized very quickly, well, I could do this architectural work it doesn't always have to be geometric. And so I started to bring in my sculptural elements into architectural work. And honestly, it's been a big part of my portfolio ever since. So I'm very good at building these complex things, meeting those requirements, but at the same time, kind of defying these geometric architectural stereotypes that are often associated with architectural items like gates and railings. This is the gate I built for the 40 under 40 show at the Renwick Museum. Uh, the Smithsonian, and then uh, they purchased it for their permanent collection. So um, up until recently, it was on the second floor, so you could go visit it. They just took it down for this very interesting um, museum-wide exhibition they're doing. Um, but this process shot illustrates, I think, why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing in my studio, and that is trying to defy those stereotypes, make something that looks like it's falling down, stand up, um, never quite confident I have it completely figured out and thus that's the risk and that's where that interest continually continually is shedding a little bit of those contemporary techniques that I learned from dad doing less forging doing more bending working not so much in the coal forge anymore but using hydraulic benders and electric welders and growing in scale and then balancing the studio between the larger architectural projects with some smaller items, uh, using those design sensibilities again, and kind of this quest to always be innovative in my design work. And this is a book sconce. We all have that favorite book that we want to show off. So this was uh, basically a single book holder that allowed you to show off your favorite book. There's a French cleat that holds it to the wall. And 
for a while there, I also had a studio under the name Iron Design Company, and Iron Design Company was making hooks and book sconces and a wine rack that's been sold to 23 different countries and even survived a, a 7.6 earthquake in Mexico City. And um, I'm backing off on a lot of that production stuff, but naturally that sense is still there. These are some recent coat racks that I've made. I call them coat rack couplets. There's one in the exhibition down at the gallery. It's steel and stainless steel, hot worked. So again, combining more traditional pieces of equipment and techniques with maybe some less traditional forms. I've made a lot of these ribbon hooks. Again, trying to take something that um, as simple as a hook and add these really dynamic, alluring qualities to them. And I'm gonna end with this project um, since we're all makers and we're always kind of curious of how things are made. Uh, this is a stainless steel bench that went to a client in Atlanta, eight foot long, um, completely structural, uh, challenging as hell to make. And this is how we made it. I started with a ram board in wooden form. And dad's favorite part is if you look to the left, there's a tiny little shiny maquette. And that was it. That allowed me to figure my materials that I need to order, get my proportions right. And whenever I wasn't quite sure of where the form should be, I could just pick up this little galvanized sheet of metal and say, okay, I'm back on track. Gradually, you're transferring the structure of the form to the metal. So I'm tracing the form with the stainless steel, I'm welding in the struts. And with each weld, this kind of flimsy fluid shape starts to rigidize. And now we're adding the strips, top and bottom. So we're essentially making a very complex torsion box, like a hollow door. As we're adding metal, we're removing wood. And then at some point it's rigidized enough that it is a self-supportive unit. And you could completely dismantle the form and then just keep welding. And that's the final product. So um, thank you very much for watching. That's it. Thank you both, that was super interesting. Um, I didn't think of a joke or anything interesting to say for the break in this one. So what I'm gonna do is guarantee that the next break, my joke or thing that I say is gonna be twice as interesting. So I'm holding myself accountable for that, um, but don't have anything right now. Next up is Kate Sarah Mitchell, who's our instructor in the Fibers studio and introducing her is the Fibers assistant, Amelia. Hello, I'm Amelia, the Fibers Assistant. Um, Kate Sarah Mitchell is an environmental and community activist, and she has a career in nonprofit management. She started as a hobby crafter until she was 50, and then she became a more devoted maker. Um, she is currently the executive director of the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild, which is the oldest artist's, artist residency in the United States. Um, and she was also the artist fellow here um, in 2016 and 2017. Please help me in welcoming Kate Sarah Mitchell. Thank you. I'm really glad to be back here. I lived um, above the dining hall for two years, for, for two long seasons. Um, so, and that was great. And I'm glad to be back here teaching. I started out in, um, in life um, in literature. So I got a master's degree in medieval comparative literature. So this is a uh, Blake's picture of Chaucer. So a lot of what I started out with was very much black and white, um, but it being medieval, there was also all this color. So there's always been this tension and this flirtation between color and black and white, um, which is why I ended up being a dyer. Um, my um, early stuff was with a lot of county fairs. Somebody else talked about being a farrier at the county fairs. I loved the county fairs and I would always, um, submit stuff to the county fairs and get ribbons. And that way I could pay for the rides and the food for my daughter to go on. And it was always fun. It was always a nice balance. Like that my, um, my money, my winnings would always cover all of our expenses for the week for the county fair. But I also started in pretty much plain stuff. I really liked natural fibers. Um, 
the large knit one was a sheep my daughter raised in 4-H and the one on the left is flax that we grew ourselves in our garden. And I'm um, still flirting with color. This is uh, some swatches that I was doing in the beginning as well, sort of traditional knitting, sweater making. Um, at one point I was really, really unhappy with my career because I wasn't getting enough, uh, I guess, color. And I, somebody asked me uh, what, I, what I wanted to do. And I said, I just need to have more color in my life. So I left my nonprofit administration. I'd worked for like the Hudson River Sloop Clearwater and done a bunch of environmental stuff. And I did a lot of grant writing and other kinds of writing. Um, so I quit all that and I opened a yarn shop. I, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good thing to do. So I did some really traditional knitting and yarn work. I did a lot of teaching. I started doing some weaving and um, I took a class. My daughter and I came here uh, about 17 years ago and we took a class in machine knitting and I loved this place and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And I really, really wanted to be part of this world because it was a level so much higher than uh, the county fair, for example, <laughs> and little jars of jam and stuff. So I really wanted to do it. And um, I was weaving stuff like this. This is, I was living on the upper Delaware at the time and the red lines is a sort of a reflection of the stairway um, rapids that are up there. And I had worked for Clearwater. So this whole thing is like this echo of the Hudson River and the Delaware Rivers and my relationship with Pete and Toshi Seeger and the work that I had done for them. Um, and this was a colorful rug that I made, a cashmere rug. Um, but I couldn't, I applied, sorry, Kristen, but I applied here like two or three times to be a fellow and I didn't even get a hello. And I was doing this work that I thought was really great, like these silk things and these casual things, but I had no bona fides. I had never been to art school. I had, I was totally pretty much self-taught. So um, I got very frustrated. I got a scholarship from the Handweavers Guild of America to go to school. So I enrolled in a one-year associate's degree program at FIT so that I could be like, yeah, I, I have a degree in art. And it was so exciting because I had never really formally tried to study art. And I think the way I presented myself, I clearly wasn't an artist, even though I was doing this, what I thought was really cool stuff um, and being exposed here to the class and everything and people who had a real arts education was very exciting. So I went to school and I learned how to do design boards. And so you see my work is kind of the same stuff. It's still these really natural colors, but I'm presenting it differently and I'm hooking it to Andrew Wyeth and I'm talking about his Helga paintings and if Helga was gonna be a fashion queen, cause she clearly wasn't. She had that, that green coat in all the paintings and stuff. But so I wanted to sort of elevate her fashion style with all alpaca stuff. So I designed a wardrobe for Helga, Andrew Wyeth's girlfriend. Um, so that was fun. And I also got to do things like start thinking about what are the colors referring to in the real world? So I started taking a lot more photos and working with doing sort of iteration work. So I spent my year at FIT. I really wanted to go to China and work with silk because I thought that would be exciting. And China wasn't hiring, but Peru was. So I ended up going down to Peru to work with uh, six women's textile cooperatives, weaving, spinning, dyeing. So I'm um, in the back right-hand corner, the one without the hat. That's me, and we're cleaning alpaca. And it was a real struggle. So I came to this group of women. We're in Peru, which is in South America. And the area I was in, right about there, about um, 20 kilometers from Machu Picchu. And I never did get to Machu Picchu, but I lived in this village that was very Inca. And um, the people we worked with were at 13,000 feet. And um, it would get really dizzying, but they were like right of the cusp when you go over to the Amazon basin. So they're up at the top in the glaciers. Um, and you can see there in, on the right, um, the glacier, and that's by their village. And then the left is um, sort of the path that goes up there. So if you were to walk it, it would probably be like six hours. And by car, it was more like three hours because the roads are really rough. So even with a car, it takes a long time to do anything. So these are sort of the inspirations. This was the view from my bedroom, which was, I was in a town called Ayante Tambo. And this was the road you took to get to the bar. And it was about like five miles down the street. Um, and that's the river, which wasn't very clean, but that's the river that ran to Machu Picchu. So these are my inspiration pictures. And then this is the stuff that we ended up making. Um, this collection was presented um, in 2016 at the Jacob Javits Center Fair Trade uh, Conference. This is, how it started. So we ended up with something like this and the color combinations. And you can see, if you look at the blue, there's some 
color variations and differences that sort of work with the design that's there. But um, this was an order that the women were filling when I first got there. And it was supposed to be, you know, regular color blocks. It wasn't supposed to be three shades of white mixed together and reds all over the place. This was supposed to be a matching set. So I had to work with them about sharing yarn for one thing. Like, so you're gonna share yarn and you're gonna alternate your red so you don't have one block of burgundy and one block of flag red. So we did a lot of work with that. I also learned, so we were doing, we were giving them designs. So there were a bunch of, um, Northern uh, European and American designers, not a bunch, there were four of us working with these six cooperatives, trying to get into or to expand our reach in the fair trade market. Usually it's sort of um, high end. I wanted to do high end homes. They had been doing a lot of purses and bags for like sort of hippie stuff. And I was trying to get them into high end homes because I thought it would get them more money. So we would give them designs, but they couldn't read the designs. And that's when I really realized you have to learn how to do a shape and to draw an arrow and say this color goes in this shape that's not something innate so we would show them these things like this design and they'd be like what is that plus they don't do circles um so we did so we got them pencils and we started doing designing stuff and we had debates about whether we want to bring these women vogue magazines because people thought it was somehow going to make them want to dress like that and i'm like these women do not want to dress like that they're never going to want to dress like that so it's astounding because all of the stuff that they're wearing, they have made themselves. Um, they use a lot of synthetic uh, dyes because they like the bright colors, but it's all hand spun. It's all hand woven stuff. They certainly have de designed it themselves and they've learned all that stuff. So it's just our designs that we wanted to get them to do. That was kind of a struggle and how we communicate their design sensibility with what we're, what can sell, what we think can sell in Europe. So these are just some more images of working with them. This is in the office and the women would bring their designs down and um, that's me smiling. So um, we did a lot of dyeing. We did a lot of work. I did a lot trying to get the dyes to be the same, but we ended up really doing process lessons in terms of changing those reds and getting those kinds of materials to work better together. But we had a lot of fun time dyeing. The master dyer, um, didn't like me a lot because I was trying to push him to do different things like these ombre colors. He's just like, what are you doing? Why do you want to have half of a, be half and half? And he just didn't understand how that would, how that could work. He also didn't like the fact that I wanted to do um, raw fibers instead of yarn because I wanted us to be able to achieve colors we wanted by blending and stuff like that. And he felt a little bit insulted that I wasn't saying his colors were good enough. So um, you can see here where I have sample colors and I'm trying to achieve these colors that we got in watercolor. And that was a little bit of a stress. And this is our second dyeing session. This was at Mercedes house. She was one of the managers. So this is part of the collection that we offered, which isn't really their style. It uses a lot of elements of their style, but um, we brought them like architectural digest magazines to try and help them understand like it has to be clean. These people do not want their pillows to smell like alpaca. Um, because they don't. So these are just some of my my pillows. Um, I did some screen printing, and then this is a pillow that they also made that I ended up sewing together. And I, this is the vest that I made specifically for the show that's on right now. And it's a bunch of um, naturally dyed rug yarns that I made a bunch of rugs, and I was trying to figure out what to do for this. And I was going to spin and then dye, and then uh, oh, that's too much work. So I just took the yarns that I had, and I made um, this sort of Scottish styled vest. But I still love like one of my favorite things is just doing really plain natural textiles and fabrics. And these are studies for shrouds. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, I promised everyone two amazing jokes. I sure did. All right, here's a joke. If you don't think it's funny, Jamie the Woodpillow sent it to me so you can blame him. How come a man driving a train got struck by lightning? No guesses? What? What? He was a good conductor. Nice job. All right. Next up is Sashka Raz um, in the special topics studio. And introducing her is our special topic slash photography fellow, Lindsay Davis. Okay. Joshka Ross is teaching clay monoprinting to this weekend and this whole week. 
She has been working with play model printing for years, developing wonderful methods to create Marid effects. She was fortunate to learn from Mitch Lyons, the master originator of this beautiful low-tech method of printmaking. Born in Canada, she has lived in the United States since earning a master's of fine arts degree for the Cranbrook Academy of Art. Since the 1990s, she has worked extensively at Peters Valley in various studios, continuing her practice, and later began working figuratively and formative, formally in her artwork. Shashka is a mixed media artist who has taught and exhibited work in Europe, Canada, Japan, and the United States. Please welcome Shashka. I'm really glad to be here at Peters Valley teaching a course and returning and seeing so many interested and exciting artists. It's uh, really wonderful to have a period of time here. So I was fortunate to have a show in 2000, the end of 2018 at Peters Valley. And my slideshow is going to start from then. Um, these are woodcuts. So my initial work in undergraduate school is in printmaking. and it's a full circle for me to come back to the clay mono printing. So it's a, a good turn of the time. Uh, these are water based, material based drawings that are um, on large sections of paper put together, um, spanning like four feet, six feet. And uh, I work a lot with nature and love to find a moment in time when something just is not what it looks like. And that was a sunset on steam coming out of a apartment building. I just thought it was so cool. I'm actually here to talk about clay monoprinting. So this is how the colors are mixed with tile six china clay. And the um, china clay is the dust that makes it adhere to the substrate, which is Rime, which is an air conditioning filter paper. And that automatically connects the colors to the Rime because of course it's designed to collect dust in the air conditioning filter paper. Uh, so you add it to the water like you would plaster and then mix it with colors. And I work on a raw clay slab that continues to stay moist and work into it with uh, colors, relief, uh, drawings, and then a lot of the imagery comes from painting first on newsprint and then applying it and printing it onto the slab. So you're building up layer after layer. And you peel that off and you keep working more and more till you're at a point where you'd pull a print. So this is the Rime and it's um, applied by using spoons on the back and small rollers. And you can see the clay slab with the gray um, margin. And you can keep, you do keep working on the same slab. You can never get an addition because the clay is pulled off with the color so that it doesn't remain the same. So you get similar pieces or a family of pieces. These are about 30 by 25, 25 by 30. Uh, I'm really interested in patterning as a form and as a plane and as a distance. So patterning's gone on with me for a long time. So these are all plain monoprints. So the stronger, more clear lines are added as drawing from a newsprint piece that's printed onto it before it's printed onto the uh, Rime substrate. I really love the color and the fluidity of working with a material like this. I uh, spent a lot of time doing paper making and um, this just was like a perfect connection. I do a lot of um, small 
tiny coil pieces in clay. Um, these monoprint type of things can actually be done in oxides and then turned into cylinders, which is what how Mitch Lyons came to the uh, practice that he finally figured out. Uh, the other half of my work is um, oil painting. And this is a three foot by four foot working with uh, containers, but focusing on the patterns. So the fact that there's a subject is one aspect, but the density and the buildup is what really keeps me going. These are uh, encaustic pieces on paper and on uh, pit fired clay. And the interior of the bowls is oil painting that's waxed over. Um, this is an early part of the uh, DNA series. I like to work a lot with nature and um, find lots of things to do always. Um, this is the first piece I did for the Nuance show that used the DNA form. And this is uh, indigo dyed uh, grass hearts with irises tied together with uh, copper wire using the um, shadow to expand the piece and then began making these larger drawings again with water media. Um, fireplace charcoal and inks with uh, watercolors. These are 60 by 80. Um, this I was thinking about um, who's really watching when all these medical things are going on and how that's controllable, how much it affects one with the genetics or disease things, heritage, relationships, and it's a group of six watching. Uh, this is a book series that was designed to open up in the middle, so it was to be bound down either side called Found or Not in the Woods. I'm interested in movement and again the, the drawingness, but then of human movement. This is during the height of COVID when you just felt like you're covered by stuff and just running and wondering and not knowing. This is actually pulling the print. Um, I do some painting and drawing on the pieces afterwards some of the time. And this is called soundings about the maritime word used for knowing what's around you and deciding, you know, if you're in a good place or not. And thanks everybody for watching and nice to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. All right. Last but not least, we have Russell Rankle in the ceramic studio and introducing him is Elizabeth McAdams, one of our ceramic assistants. I didn't tell you that. Hey so Russell Rankle is an associate professor of art at Southern Utah University. He is the founder of shapetheorycollective.com an online gallery dedicated to helping free the 40,000 nonviolent cannabis prisoners caught up in the war on drugs. He is a ceramics artist who lives and works in southern Utah and seeks solace and meaning in the Red Rock Desert as often as possible. Join me in welcoming Russell Rankle.
Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be here. I had an apprentice about 15 years ago named Danny Crump. Does anyone remember Danny Crump? Yes, he came here and I've been envious of him ever since. And finally, I got the nod. So thanks for having me. So this is where I live. I'm going to go through these slides really fast because I'm told we only have 10 minutes and I have more slides than I should have. So this is a, a trail that I walk up every day. My workout is lifting heavy rocks. And I'm, my goal at the end of the summer is to have a pile of 30 pound rocks above my head um, by the end of the summer. This is the house that I grew up on. My room was the door on the right. And um, my dad was inspired by ghost towns and we'd go on family vacations and visit old um, uh, run down ghost towns and he built our house like that so my house was my room was on the right and I had a gun like this and I would shoot rabbits like this from that front deck in my underwear and I would end up with these guys and I would skin them um, because I wanted to um, justify my murderous mindset so um, I didn't do anything with them, but I did have a pile of skins that I thought maybe some health guy would come along and buy them from me, um, not know, not understanding that jackrabbit fur is pretty um, nasty. So I understand how the skin works and how you pull the skin off the body. You cut around the, the wrist or the ankles of the rabbit and through the crotch, and then you pull the skin off like a sock. And so I understood that. And so I started to fold that childhood experience into um, my work. Um, <clears throat> my dad was a gardener for the movie stars and this was his tool of choice. I walked behind in Palm Springs, California, by the way. And I walked behind a mower just like this, probably, I don't know, hundreds of miles. And he mowed Steve McQueen's lawn. And this was the or I mowed Steve McQueen's lawn, let's say. And this was the house that um, we, one of the houses that, that he took care of. Um, this picture was actually taken about the time that my dad was um, the gardener because those planters on the right, I remember those um, <clears throat> lounge chairs, I remember seeing Ally McGraw and Steve McQueen laying out on that. I remember watering those hanging baskets and that was the lawn that we mowed. And the reason I'm showing you these images is because I, for the longest time, I just thought they were, it was just a bad experience working for my dad. And looking back, I might have been influenced by that line and, and texture and those built environments. This house, I don't, I don't, I'm, I think it was this house, but it might not have been, but there was a, a, a spider monkey that lived on that wall and it was chained up and it would latch, latch onto my leg every time I walked by. Um, he mowed, we mowed Barry Manilow's lawn and, and that's not a euphemism. And this is um, one of the houses, a really famous house in Palm Springs. Um, this is another image of that same house. And then there was the Elrod house um, that, we worked on and this was all concrete, a really beautiful home. I tried to, I took my family to Palm Springs on vacation and I tried to get into this private resident, private gated community to see these homes and the guard wouldn't let us in. They were pretty aggressive. Um, and then Liberace, of course, that was his house and pretty crazy house. Um, I remember trimming that Bolgan, Bolgan Villa and this is the front view of his house. And so I got to um, school at Brigham Young University and I took an art history class and I remember seeing this and just being blown away by this Greek riton. And ever since I've seen this, I have tried to create work that, that matches this in quality and, um, and feeling that I got from this piece. I still am really inspired by this piece. Um, and then going back in time, um, back to that house that I grew up in, um, we were having dinner one Sunday afternoon and my back was behind the dirt road in front of our house. And beyond that road was just desert. And then about a mile beyond that was a couple of houses that we had neighbors living in. And I was um, 
I, we were having tacos or something for dinner and my sister and mom, mom were sitting there and uh, they became really surprised by something happening behind me on the dirt road. And I turned around and there was a, there was a horse um, sauntering by and I knew the horse because it lived at Bill's house, but I didn't know the naked lady on the back of the horse. And so um, I got my um, dad's binoculars and found her the next day sunbathing above the horse corral and I crawled military style to try to get closer to her. And she sat up with her cocktail in one hand and a fly swatter in the other, and I ran home. But, um, but I, so I became more curious, and I'm just probably 13 or 14, um, became more curious. And, and they also raised pigeons, the, um, this couple that lived there. And I suddenly became interested in pigeons. And I got to know, I got, I insinuated myself on on this uh, on this couple that lived there, and um, became comfortable enough with them that they invited me into the house and introduced me to this movie. Do you, anyone remember this movie? And I was really young and um, watched this movie with thoroughly, I don't know what would you say. Um, invigorated let's say by this movie but completely embarrassed and ashamed because I would walk home after visiting these people with the naked lady and Banshee the horse and the pigeons and I would walk home and see my mom making dinner in the in the kitchen through the front window and just this dichotomy of of feelings like this home feeling versus whatever was happening across the way and so I started making these rabbits to reference that time. And the rabbits are, are a reference to, in my memory, that I, I've got, since gone to try to find the opening scenes of that memory and of that movie. And um, it just sent me down a rabbit hole. And I, didn't, I've, I decided that the memory was more important than reality. And so in my memory, there's the opening scene is Linda Lovelace on the kitchen counter filing her nails and re receiving pleasure from a gentleman caller. And so that's what this work is about. Um, and it's also about loss of innocence. It, it's about my complicity in that, um, in, in, in my loss of innocence. So these are some other pieces that I make in reference to that. And you'll see that all of my work um, references animals and, and in Aesop's fables, animals uh, are reference to the human condition. And even in more contemporary literature, animals are used to illustrate um, what humans experience. So I was just in a show in France and this is how they describe my work. And I love it, although it doesn't really, <laughs> Russell Rankle's sculptures evoke the world of latex, bondage and sadomasochism, setting forth an argument for the vital energy therein. I don't participate in any of these things. If you, if you, uh, if there was a secret camera in my bedroom, you would think my wife and I are quite boring. So this is some more images. And so the class right now, we're making dogs and rabbit heads. And what else are we making? Yeah, buzzards. So this is just a few of a series of seven pieces that I made. So I'm just kind of scooting along pretty fast here. Um, if I'm known for anything, I'm known for how I can make um, red earthenware look like stretched fabric or stretched skin. Um, um, this is probably about 14 inches long. And the only reason there's a fry, there's a, you know why there's a rabbit um, skin stretched because I used to skin rabbits, but you don't know why the, there's a fry pan and I don't either, except I think fry pans are really cool shapes. And, <laughs> and I was frying eggs and I thought, oh, I should see what I can do with this. So this is uh, a piece that I made in reference to, I don't know what, and I don't know if I need to know, but I was in the studio when my, I was making all this other work where the hands are manipulating fleshy things. And I was asked, I was telling my son who was 16 at the time, poor kid, I feel like I need to do a penis. And 
And I said, but I'm afraid that whatever the repercussions are going to be. And he said, Dad, you tell us to do things that make us scared. And so you should, you should, you should do it too. And so I made that piece. This one's called Fingering the Aorta. Um, this is another piece. I was doing a workshop in Salt Lake City last week and, and there was a participant there and she, a friend of hers knew that she was gonna take my workshop and she said, don't do it. He's, an, he's anti-female, you should see his work. And maybe I, maybe I am, but I don't think I am. You know, there's a lot of stuff that operates on the subconscious for all of us. And maybe there's some issues with my mother, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway, so these are some things that, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking about fetish, you know, I get really, I don't know, excited about women in high heel shoes, and, but I'm also interested in, in, in revulsion. So it's this like weird tension between attraction and revulsion that I'm, that I'm uh, thinking about with this work. Um, this was part of that show in France, you know, that I know how to stretch skin. What you don't know is that I own a, a real, um, no, not Will the Beast. I always forget the, the name of the skull, um, forgive me. But uh, when Steve McQueen died, his estate came and got all the stuff from his house. And then they invited the gardener to come get whatever he wanted that was left over. And he got two skulls like this. And I still have this skull. It's a, yes yes it's a heart of beast this is about this this big yeah yeah it's a heart of beast thank you for that and again if you know anything you know um if you know my work i'm i guess i'm known for how to stretch things um we're gonna i'm gonna show the class tomorrow how to make a conjoined buzzard like this um this is a riton a reference to the early greek ritons and iranian ritons and this is a piece that is relatively recent, well, within the last year that I'm pretty thrilled about. Um, it's a, a vulture eating a Gila monster, eating a rabbit. It's all ceramics, yeah. Yeah, wheel thrown. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. I, make, I make most everything solid and then cut them in half and hollow them out. And then this piece, I started with a detail on this piece. I'm really excited about this piece, um, pretty recent. So this is a bighorn sheep skull with a, with a rabbit skin stretched over the top of it. So Shape Theory Collective, I started this online gallery um, a year ago, January 20th. And the purpose of the gallery is to make money for artists and myself. Um, I, I always wanna be transparent about my ambition to, to make money. Um, it's not a nonprofit, but it might be someday, but our, our mission is also to donate to the Last Prisoner Project to help free the 40,000 cannabis prisoners that are in this country. Um, and these are a few of the artists that are on Shape Theory Collective currently. Ceramic people may know some of these, these artists. And it's an evolving um, online gallery um, in terms of um, do we have permanent artists or do we have um, monthly shows? And right now we're having monthly shows. And so this is the cover page. So this guy is serving um, a long time in jail. At the same time, Seth Rogen started a cannabis brand. And I don't, I don't um, fault Seth Rogen or deny that he should deny him the opportunity to make money off of cannabis. But I don't think he should be making money off of cannabis while this guy is serving 23 years for doing the exact same thing, or that Martha Stewart shouldn't be, uh, or she should be, but all these 40,000 people should be free. So the target of prohibition was not the drug so much as those most associated with its use. Typically in the United States, drug statutes have been aimed and selectively enforced against a feared or disparaged group within society. And Smoke Signals is a book on the history of cannabis um, that was extremely, that I just recently finished, really interesting. Um, you think we're in a dark, we are in a dark, dark, dark time right now in this country. 
but it's been dark in the past too. The war on drugs didn't start with Richard Nixon. It started long before that. He just amped it up a little bit. So these are some of the people that are in jail. Um, the Last Prisoner Project has has um, focused on on these men in the, their last social media posts because all these men are fathers and they're trying to maintain their fatherhood while they're in prison and they're also and anyway it breaks my heart this um, michael thompson just got out of jail recently after serving 28 years i tuned into um his welcome home party in minnesota and on on instagram and it was such a moving experience because he stood up there and, and thanked the audience and there was a band behind him and he was thanking um, everyone for coming and starting to tell his story a little bit and he just started to break down and cry and um, the drummer behind him said we got you brother and it just this love in that room just blew me away but what he was crying about is is he and I didn't know this and I'm sure none of you know this but when you're when you're taking it when you're put in prison you're taking a, you're taken away from your loved ones and you and which is heartbreaking but then when you're released, you're also taken and taken away from your brothers and your your family in prison. And he was he was mourning the loss of his his uh, prison brothers by being released. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. That was super interesting and really important. Thanks for sharing all that with us. Um, that concludes our artist presentations for the night. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I had another joke, but I really forgot it. I didn't bring my phone up. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> next time. Um, so thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your workshop. If, oh, I'm gonna bring my phone. I'm gonna tell you the joke. Excellent, excellent. We have the joke. We're gonna tell the joke. We're gonna do it. Okay. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl go to the bathroom? The P is silent. <laughs> that was a good one. All right, so that concludes it. Um, again, enjoy <laughs> enjoy the rest of your workshops. If you need anything, please let the office know. Um, and have a great night. Thank you. Hello, and thank you so much for watching this program. Peters Valley would like to thank its sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to Peters Valley's channel to receive more like it in the future.